I'm so excited to look at Amela here because she's a true specialist and expert in the field of nutrition. For those of you who don't know Amela, let me introduce her a little bit. Uh, Amela is uh, coming from Sarajevo. Uh, she studied uh, medicine in Graz, Austria. Afterwards, she decided her passion is in nutrition, so she moved to uh, Dublin and London where she studied nutrition. And after her studies, she worked for clinics in the UK, in uh, Ireland, Spain. But then uh, her heart uh, <laughs> beat for uh, Sarajevo, for Bosnia, so she came back. Uh, with her family back to Sarajevo where she started her own private practice and uh, there she is meeting a lot of couples, more and more couples uh, yes. I hear, uh, uh, that are fighting infertility and that uh, she's uh, helping and uh, after I uh, started talking to her I instantly knew that she's the right person uh, that we would like to start collaboration with because Prague Fertility Center is a fertility clinic uh, that is really uh, passionate about individual approach to um, uh, helping couples uh, uh, when uh, to um, treating infertility and uh, this is where Amela is uh, on the same page she's really empathetic she likes uh, to treat uh, couples individually and we both like to uh, look at the um, uh, treatment of fertility from a very uh, complex uh, perspective and uh, uh, we both believe that it's not all about just medicine or nutrition. We all have to work together towards the same goal, which is um, couples becoming parents. So once again, warm welcome, Amela. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and before I give you my word, uh, I would like to tell you some organizational uh, things. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for asking the questions uh, in the registration form. We received fantastic 150 questions from you. And so we could see uh, there were some questions that repeated quite a lot, such as uh, how can uh, I help uh, my AMH go up or how can I improve my egg quality by nutrition or changing lifestyle? How can my partner uh, increase his sperm count by changing his lifestyle and nutrition? Uh, specific uh, questions uh, related to uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, which are not so specific anymore because, uh, as Amala said, she's seeing more and more patients um, yes. that are struggling with this issue. Uh, the same goes for us uh, and we could see it in your questions that uh, this was a very common topic. So we would like to tackle that one as well sure. and more and more. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, if, you, if, if uh, another question uh, comes up in your head while Amala is talking, Please uh, don't be worried, you can ask the question in, uh, there is a, like an icon in the bottom um, right corner, like shapes, and uh, there you, you will find a Q&A um, form, so you can ask your question anonymously if you wish, and we will try to answer as many uh, questions as possible. So without further ado, um, Amela, the word is yours. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you so much once again for inviting me. I think that Prague Fertility Center is a fantastic place for couples all around the world uh, to come and search for the answer when it comes to, I wouldn't even use the words infertility, I think it's fertility and all the options available to couples to search for the right solution because as you well said it's tailor-made and that's why we're on the same page as you well said because we're all so different and we're all coming from a different background in terms of our health, genetic makeup, um, um, stress, um, all sorts of things that shape us in terms of our uh, fertility and overall health. So I think together uh, with this integrative uh, 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 one word would be really like a general approach but with a very individual uh, sections in terms of all the issues that, we, that can affect fertility. We can do fantastic uh, uh, work and we can improve fertility, we can work with couples individually, with a female and male fertility, in order to really increase their chances of becoming a parent and not only getting pregnant, but you know, having a healthy pregnancy and healthy baby onwards. So that's why I think we need and it's essential for this personal medicine to take approach, uh, a stronger approach in, in terms of fertility and overall uh, human health. So as you all said, uh, in my practice, I see uh, more and more uh, problems with fertility and they come from both sides. So 
again, as you all see in your center, we don't really um, separate female and male patients. We like to work with them together. And uh, fertility as such has to be a joint um, venture. So uh, a lot of hormonal imbalances I see, and they're very common, not only here in the Balkans, but everywhere around the world. So we see that in Ireland, England, in Spain, United States, Australia, couples everywhere struggle with fertility due to hormonal imbalances. And common things, again, that pop up would be polycystic ovary syndrome, insulin resistance, autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto, um, uh, obesity, weight uh, issues with male and female patients, um, then of course burnout, stress-related diseases. So all of that is very strongly linked to uh, fertility and ability to uh, stay pregnant and obtain healthy pregnancy and healthy baby. So all of that really can be uh, changed through the lifestyle changes and particularly when it comes to their sleep choices and nutrition. So uh, I understand that everyone's uh, different, like uh, all the nations are different, they have different mm -hmm. lifestyles, they have different cuisines, and I can see that uh, more and more people are connecting from different parts of the world. So are there any general rules uh, how uh, both males and females can improve their fertility through nutrition? Some general, of course, yes, the, the kind of the general rules were, were general suggestions, like let's say if we can divide them in kind of a few objectives would be first of all to clean up their diet. So when I say that, it's mainly really to avoid processed food. And it's very hard nowadays because most of the food, not only processed, but now it's becoming even ultra processed food, which is uh, the problem in, in, in the way that it is, uh, first of all, there's too much saturated fats. So we know that saturated fats uh, and trans fatty acids that's at the added to these foods, uh, they're making them more palatable and that's why then they become more addictive, so people would go and search for these foods more and more. So, you know, that's how they actually, you know, become addictive by adding these things into the food. Um, and they're common everywhere. So they're around the world, and it's not a particular nation is, you know, more prone to eat these type of foods than other. So we can say that that's a worldwide phenomenon. That's why one of the reasons why obesity uh, and infertility rates are kind of going up, because these foods are available. Why are they available? They're cheaper. They're common and they're everywhere basically. Mm -hmm. If you go down the, the, the main street in any city around the world, you will find these foods. And they, we're normalizing these foods, unfortunately. So they're used, they're advertised. So without even knowing, we become like hypnotized by mm -hmm. you know eating them. So that's one of the things that everybody should do, really. Not it's, it's not an optional. I think everybody should really avoid processed food. That's really going back you know, cooking your food. So, you know, cooking homemade food, controlling what goes into your food. It's not necessarily, and we, of course, in, in cost-wise, it's uh, taking into account that people should eat organic. But we can do it, uh, certain, certain things we can do it locally and we can eat uh, seasonally. By mm -hmm. doing that, the nutrient value of the food is increasing. So, we're getting more and more, uh, all the nutrients important for fertility. We're getting the food that we control, what kind of effects are going in, particularly the food that how it's being termed, um, uh, uh, cooked. So higher the temperature, these oils can of course go rancid and become radical, uh, uh, release radical free radicals and we know that that's causing all sorts of diseases including obesity and cancers and autoimmune diseases. So we control so much by you know controlling where the food comes from and how we cook the food. So that's a very basic step but certainly one that most people around the world have kind of um, become very foreign to because we um, we become hooked to these foods and we we tend to eat outside it's cheaper less stress so probably we don't want to go in shops and buy our foods the majority of people that I see in my practice is the people who actually don't cook food at home so you know just one basic step to going back home and cooking your food from you know scratch and you can avoid so much in terms of you know these uh, factors that would be uh, triggers mm -hmm. uh, in terms of inflammatory diseases and uh, of course weight gain. So that's number one. Number two is uh, when, we come to, when it comes to food, it's the quality of food in terms of macro and micronutrients. Mm -hmm. Macronutrients of course would be your protein, your carbohydrates, your fats. So knowing what these things mean really in reality. Of course none of us should be uh, uh, you know going into details you know biochemistry and chemistry but certainly you know knowing that your protein will regulate your appetite. So that immediately will help with the weight gain and uh, long-term with obesity. And again, with uh, inflammation that is causing to, you know, high uh, food intake and calorie intake. So 
Protein is the element uh, in terms of animal protein, of course, there's fish, there's the meat, there's poultry, and of course we have vegan and vegetarian uh, protein. In these cases, people have to be aware that uh, nutritional density versus amount is different. So for, some, for those who are watching us or listening tonight, uh, they need to be aware that for vegan and vegetarian, they have to eat more of those type of protein in order to get enough protein to balance the blood sugar levels. Because we, in nutrition, we always look for the food that's balancing blood sugar levels. That means, and we'll raise this later on to positive ovaries and insulin, that's the key thing in maintaining healthy weight and you know keeping the insulin under control because the insulin is an inflammatory hormone. Mm -hmm. So by you know eating enough protein per meal, you immediately feel more satisfying and you are fuller over the longer period of time. So let's say our first meal, which is for most people breakfast, whenever that is, is the one that we need to focus on protein. So there has to be protein-rich food. Then of course carbohydrates, certainly most people are going for the most processed version. So go for the whole grain. Uh, in different cultures, there are different types of grains. So you know, go for the one that's more native to your country and the region you brought up. So look what your grandparents and great grandparents have eaten. I always go for that type of a grain. So that means you resonate better genetically with that grain. If you're in Asia, of course, that would be rice. If you're in parts of Europe, that would be more uh, wheat. That would be more uh, bulgur. That would be um, corn. Mm -hmm. In some parts of America, uh, certainly. So certainly, uh, you know, look for that. And of course, that should be whole grain. And ideally, for the grains, I would, I would prefer it if they are organic, so not uh, heavily sprayed and uh, uh, full of pesticides and herbicides that we know have an effect on your hormones. And then, of course, fats. One of my favorite things when it comes to hormones, um, fat is essential in creating every single hormone. Without the fat, we can't create a hormone. So be very uh, well aware of what kind of fat you, you know, put on your plate. You know, that could be your seeds, your nuts, a cold-pressed olive oil, cold-pressed sunflower oil, could be a cold-pressed uh, uh, avocado oil if you have one. Um, then, of course, adding olives and avocados, if that's native to your country, would be additional good fats. Mm -hmm. So then you have like a balanced plate. With that, I can immediately be very happy as nutritionists that we have achieved, you know, starting point in creating a healthy body and, of course, healthy hormones. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of uh, the nutrition, uh, what other lifestyle changes uh, could uh, people easily do? Okay, well, there, um, except the nutrition, I mean, they're like we call it the cornerstone of the health. So we have a nutrition, a stress control, uh, we have a sleep, and we have an exercise. It's like a, a four legs of a table. So sleep is a very important part, and all very often are, are overlooked um, and not addressed properly. As you all know, and we've talked over the last five days, and we've known that you know when you talk to male or female, it doesn't matter, but they don't sleep. They think they do, but they go to bed too late, and they stay, uh, they sleep long hours. So there are certain things that can be done in order to be for us to sleep correctly, and in order to you know repair our hormonal balance. Hormones are always forever repaired and constructed, so to say, in hours between 11 p.m. and 1 in the morning. Why is this important? It's called circadian rhythm. So this is something that we inherited from the first humans. Our first homo sapiens really slept like that. And it's in our DNA. So we can't change that. There's no amount of supplementation, broccoli, um, maca, whatever we take in order to you know, get better in terms of our hormones that that can, that can be corrected. So we need to sleep better. So that means before you go to sleep, you need to have proper sleep hygiene so your body can get ready for the quality of sleep that's needed in order for us to you know, create healthy hormones. Um, ideally, again, something to be repeated. So this is a routine. And for those who are already parents or have kids around them, know that when we put kids to sleep, we give them a meal, we give them a bath, we read them a book, and they go to sleep. That's ideally something we should replicate to us adults. So, you know, have a meal at least three hours before the time to go to bed. So let's say you're going to bed at 10.30. So by 7, 6.30 should be your last meal. So your body has enough time to digest the food. So when you go to sleep, you're not digesting the food. That means, you know, your body can focus on repairing and creating healthy hormones for the, your uh, next day. If you go to bed full stomach, all the good blood goes into your digestion and, you know, focusing on digestion and away from the hormonal impairment. So be aware, do not eat too late. That's a really important thing. Then, you know, your bedroom should be dark ideally cold so you know the temperature is too, too, too hot or too cold it means around 18 degrees uh, 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 celsius so you know your body can rest properly it's not sweating and it's uh, ready again for this 
the preparation process um, and do something relaxing. If it's reading, if it's stretching, if it's yoga, meditation, whatever makes easy thing for you to sleep in, in terms of the quality. And again, that you can repeat it. It doesn't matter if you're at home, traveling, visiting family, on our holidays, it's the same thing to be repeated in order for your hormone to be repaired uh, in a proper way. And that's the window. If we do skip, we will feel it next morning. Often people will say, oh, it's very hard for me to get up. I feel very tired. I need my coffee in the morning. I need two coffees. I need my cigarette or whatever stimulants in order to get up. That means that your cortisol, which is the hormone should be the highest in the morning, hasn't been properly corrected and repaired in order to wake you up. And that happens to the majority of people around the world because we're frontally stressed. So that cortisol should be the highest in the morning, not highest in the evening, which majority of people, again, do get a second wind. They work late, then they want, of course, to relax and do things for themselves. They raise the cortisol again in the evening, and there's not enough in the morning to actually wake them up. Because we should all wake up in the morning going, ta-da, it's a beautiful day. And very rarely that ever happens mm -hmm. to most people. They're like tired, okay, they're like, when they're younger, you know, you can kind of manage because you're, of course, younger in the body. But as soon as you get into your 30s and 40s, you really feel the effect of not sleeping correctly. So sleep is essential and not something we can modify in any shape or form with any other intervention, but sleeping correctly and falling asleep correctly. So that's really, really important. The third thing is exercise. Body needs to move. Again, over-exercising body is not good for you as well, because we know, uh, and what you probably have seen this in the clinic as well, that female and male who overexercise, they have a hormonal misbalance. So body needs to move, but not over uh, exercising because the female patient I see that often they can miss their period, they don't ovulate because there's not enough energy for body to create healthy uh, babies. So don't over exercise your body mm -hmm. as well. So that can be in your process for female as well patients, you know, when they're underweight often that happens because they're over exercising, not eating, not eating enough of calories. So in your body can't menstruate, your body can't ovulate properly because menstruation mm -hmm. ovulation really is a is a sign for body that's healthy. And for male patients as well, you know, over exercising can you know uh, raise their uh, stress hormones too much because over exercising mm -hmm. is stressful for the body. So it has to be balanced. And I think we know very well it listens to our body when we do uh, when we make that mistake. And um, fourthly, is stress control mm -hmm. hugely important as well because we need to find something that. I always say that makes our heart sing, whatever that is. For some people, it's going for a walk, you know, on a daily basis, 15 to 20 minutes. Sometimes it's, you know, listening to a good uh, music, talking to a friend over the phone, meeting a friend for a coffee or a tea. So whatever that is, but make it a daily habit, something that you can just download our stress levels and something that's really is fulfilling. Or it's a hobby, like, you know, photography, painting, singing, whatever it is, you know, something that we should enjoy. So if we can create these four things on a daily basis, it really is like bringing back health to us, mm -hmm. into us. We are, you know, achieving already good 60 to 70% in hormonal balance. Perfect, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, one of the very common questions that we had from you guys was, uh, how can I raise my AMH uh, with uh, nutrition? And we are seeing a lot of these patients at our clinic that uh, are coming here with a low AMH, uh, low, egg, um, uh, lo lo a low egg count. So can they do something about that or is that separate? Uh, yes, uh, they can. Uh, definitely food choices and all other aspects that I've mentioned earlier, uh, we don't need to repeat ourselves. But in terms of egg quality and AMH, uh, there are a few things we can do. Um, so I'll just name them uh, in, according uh, to the importance, so to say. Processed food we already talked about. So avoiding processed food is essential in terms of egg, egg quality uh, and anti-miller hormone because it's proven that processed food is inflammatory and really does affect the egg quality. So mm -hmm. really clean up your diet, simply as that, and you know, follow these steps that I mentioned earlier. Secondly, uh, there are certain uh, nutrients that we can add to food in order to improve the egg quality. Folic acid is one of them, and it's often added to the uh, uh, supplements, uh, uh, female and male. Um, we know it's very important for neural development of the baby, but it's really important for the egg quality as well. So uh, folic acid in terms of food, I always would be first food and supplementation. Folic acid we can find in green leafy vegetables, whole grains, um, in liver, in uh, red meat, uh, organ meats in particular, so mm -hmm. folic acid. 
Then there's a mineral zinc, hugely important, called fertility mineral, in both female and male. Uh, zinc is essential for so many things, but when it comes to egg quality, is really, really important. Again, zinc is defined as food, um, food sources of zinc would be seeds and nuts, particularly pumpkin seeds, and then seafood. So if you're in the area where seafood is more accessible, that includes more seafood, shellfish in particular, is very good source of zinc. Mm -hmm. Oysters, we know they're a very good source of zinc. Um, thirdly, um, and very important, is vitamin D, sunshine vitamin. Vitamin D uh, is important uh, for immune system in general. We know through COVID that was very popular, but a lot of people don't associate that with egg quality and antimalarial hormone. But again, I'm seeing that intervention with D-vitamin can make a difference. Uh, vitamin D, again, if, it, if, we, if you're living in the parts of the world where you can expose yourself safely to the sun, I would advise, you know, up to 20 minutes darker skin needs more. So, you know, if you're dark skin like myself, olive oil, olive skin, sorry, or darker, if you're, you know, um, uh, uh, African, then it's really half an hour per day, but it could be part of your body. It doesn't have to be full body exposure. So legs, arms, whichever you prefer. Ideally, uh, the, when the sun is the strongest, then it's the most vitamin D uh, we have in, in, in terms of the sun uh, sources. If not, then supplement. You know, vitamin D3 in combination with phytovitamins is the best form for the best absorption. They need these cofactors to go together and combine that with a food. Vitamin D should always be taken with the food. Um, something that a lot of people don't know, but the, uh, the plastic uh, component is a lot of food that we eat and in the containers that we take, a lot of all of us have this um, element called bisphenol A or, or BPA, and this chemical uh, is shown to decrease the quality of eggs. So mm -hmm. avoidance of plastic containers in food is really important, both female and male, but when talking in terms of um, egg quality, I would advise every single woman in the world to avoid plastic containers. Really, if you can, there's ceramic, there's glass. In terms of the cooking, preserving the food, buying the food, avoid, avoid this panel A uh, in all means, even without even looking at the proposal, particularly when it comes to air quality, is something to be avoided. Interesting. Well, uh, how about the male factor? Because now we have been uh, talking a lot about female, yes. but uh, we had lots of questions about uh, sperm count. Uh, that, um, can males somehow increase their sperm count? Yes, 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 yes. We, we like to say that uh, it, it takes two for tango. So of course, male, male fertility and the quality of sperm, their motility, fragmentation is very, very important for uh, you know, good uh, outcomes. Um, and we know now that the science uh, has proven over and over again, between 40 to 60 percent uh, um, impact on fertility or uh, ability to have a quality um, uh, quality of pregnancy. So I would advise all male patients um, to look into their food. Again, processed food, I have to uh, say that is first thing. So trans fatty acids present in the food. And like if, if you're a male and if you're not cooking, then you know when you're buying food, look at the ingredients. If there's any sign of trans fatty acids, please do not buy it. The cheap type of fats um, often find in, in, in a consumed goods so you know any baked goods that you're buying but also in food that's fried deep fried has trans fatty acids and commonly eating you know uh, food that we male commonly eat more so than female so in a processed food something to absolutely avoid you know so be aware of it that there's no there's no space particularly i mean i always say to the people i mean it, uh, it's not uh, fair to the future generations that you can't really take up to a year so preconception and conception period to look after that it's not so much to ask so please 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 avoid uh, processed food um, omega-3 fatty acids are proven to uh, have increased sperm mobility uh, we define that in a fatty fish so this is salmon this is tuna this is anchovies these are sardines mm -hmm. mackerel of course uh, always look for the wild fish uh, or organically Farmed because if it's not, then you know we have presence of chemicals, antibiotics, and hormones. So uh, when eat fish is eaten, then look for uh, you know cleaner fish. If that's not an option, of course supplementation is the second way to do it. Omega three fatty acids and look uh, for the very good quality. And again, eat uh, uh, eat that with the food. I mean they're called essential fatty acids for mm -hmm. a reason because we can't produce that. So we need to have uh, either intake through the food or supplementation. 
and the word essentially means that means that every single cell in our body, every single membrane in our body needs these fatty mm -hmm. acids to integrate into a cell membrane in order for that to be elastic to the degree you can communicate with the rest of the body and that goes for the sperm. It's really important that these fatty acids are present in the food. If it's a vegan and a vegetarian, maybe you should just mention that for those who actually don't eat fat or fish, then of course it's algae, uh, it's seeds uh, uh, and uh, uh, nuts, a good source of uh, avocados, mm -hmm. olive oil, again, a good source of uh, essential fatty acids. Um, uh, third thing that I would mention, as for female, is folic acid. Uh, uh, although they manage the source of it, so uh, for the male, uh, for the male uh, DNA fragmentation of the sperm, uh, it's very important to add folic acid. Um, um, zinc, uh, again, fertility, uh, uh, as I've called it, my favorite fertility mineral, it's important, and selenium. Uh, so if you're taking better supplementation, then combine zinc and selenium together, because they co-factor and support absorption of each other, and often you will find them in a good supplement for, mm -hmm. uh, for males, that is why it's a good multivitamin with a correct dose of zinc and selenium, so you have all these co-factors to be absorbed. And one more thing when it comes to zinc, uh, sorry, to sperm is B vitamins. B vitamins are very important. They give energy to the sperm, mm -hmm. so they actually give that final push. Uh, whole grains, uh, green leafy vegetables, uh, fantastic source of B vitamins, or you know, in terms of the uh, supplementation, it's a good B complex. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, there is one question that uh, you, many of you touched, and uh, that's very becoming very common at our clinic as well, um, is the excessive weight or even obesity uh, with patients. Uh, we are often seeing patients who are coming to us and uh, they are maybe 20 kilos overweight and we are advising or our doctors are advising them uh, that the fertility uh, treatment would be much more successful if they were able to lose some weight uh, before mm -hmm. starting the program. Uh, so uh, the question is, does it make sense to lose the weight? Is it really this important? Can okay. it be done without that? Or uh, even if I'm going to, through an IVF treatment, I heard that I can gain up to five kilos, so uh, wouldn't I be lo losing these kilos? Uh, it, wouldn't it be waste if I have to gain them again? So wh what would you think about it? Does, it? does it make sense to lose weight? Absolutely, and it's proven that just losing even up to 10 kilos makes a huge difference in terms of IVF outcome, and this goes for both partners. Uh, so um, getting the weight under control, it uh, has a direct outcome on IVF, uh, but also in fertility in general. So if both partners uh, can and they should really look after their weight, uh, we have better fertility outcomes, better uh, IVF outcomes and better pregnancy because if, for example, if a female patient comes into the process and we even get to the process of uh, fertilization and we get her pregnant, if she does go into this uh, with the weight issue, the chances of preeclampsia, high blood pressure, developing uh, gestation diabetes are very, very high. And these diseases, not only will she'll suffer to the pregnancy, but that will continue onwards after the pregnancy. So that's a really huge risk factors and that could affect her pregnancy. And thirdly, if both partners are overweight, we have the genetic predispositions for the baby. So if one partner is overweight, the chances of the baby being overweight is between 20 and 35 percent for one parent. But if two parents, which often I see, and I'm sure you see it in clinic as well, are overweight, the chances for this baby to be overweight are between 30 and 45 percent. Mm -hmm. So this baby doing everything right, so if it eats all the right foods, it still has a genetic predisposition to be overweight. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite unfair to put this on one baby that parents go into the story of fertility and uh, pregnancy without uh, putting an effort in weight loss. And that, again, doesn't have to be a huge amount, mm -hmm. but I've seen in my practice that couples in up to three months can lose 20 kilos, and if they go even for a longer period of time, being pre-conception or conception, they can lose even between 40 and 60 kilos. And that really, it takes an effort on both sides. And I would advise both couples, no matter where the weight is, if it's both or one, really to do this as a part of a team. It's much better if they support mm -hmm. each other, then you know the, the results are much better. But really, weight is a huge, huge issue, and it's becoming more common. Unfortunately, because uh, overweight people uh, uh, are becoming, uh, uh, I would say, it's not even an um, epidemic, it's pandemic now around the world. 
so uh, obesity levels are rising, and obesity levels are rising among the chil among the children. If you were, look at the world statistics, so every second person is overweight, and every second preparer child is overweight. So these are the world statistics, and that's very very scary mm -hmm. and frightening because we know that these children, these adults, if not corrected, they become insulin resistant. They will develop diabetes uh, type two. And with that, cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, lifelong diseases. So mm -hmm. I think by changing all of these aspects of, uh, of diet and lifestyle, we can do an amazing thing for ourselves and for our future generations. So it does make sense. Enormous. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, now I will go to uh, some of the questions so that are more specific. Uh, I've been diagnosed with insulin resistance and PCOS, which cause irregular ovulation and difficulty conceiving. I'm interested in your opinion on how nutrition can change uh, my uh, stage and what, what exactly should I do, how should I change my diet? Okay, so uh, the, the thing, in terms of insulin resistance and polycystic ovary syndrome, they are interconnected because polycystic ovary syndrome is uh, inevitably a uh, result of uh, the sugar disbalance. So what this does, so we have, if we have a, a, a disbalance in insulin, so let's say it's constant, uh, and it's very, again, common, unfortunately, among the people, when insulin goes up, testosterone goes up, so androgen hormones in the female are going up, and the progesterone and estrogen, the ones that we want in the balance, are going down. As a result, uh, the cysts are formed, so there's no proper ovulation, and of course there's no proper cycle. So that can be very much corrected with the lifestyle change, and particularly when it comes to food. So uh, once you correct the food that causes the insulin spikes, you correct these dis hormonal disbalances. So really, how we eat and what we eat has direct uh, effect on insulin. So for example, when I talked about earlier the composition of macro and micro micronutrients on, in, on our food plate, this is where the protein takes enormously important role. Correct amount of protein gives it off a, a sense of satiety, so that means we're fuller, and that means our blood sugar is under control. So really avoiding processed food, grains in particular, sugary foods. And that's very common in a lot of cultures. It's, it's a, pastries, uh, uh, pastas, grains dominate the plate. So I would always say to my patients, let's just change the proportion or dynamic of your plate. Instead of filling it with the grains and you know pastries and dough, Let's give that plate uh, section to the protein. So dominantly have a protein aspect filled with that section of foods. Really, like if I look at the plate, so the round circle, half of the plate I will fill with vegetables. Vegetables give me, uh, they give me uh, uh, vitamins, they give me the minerals, they give me antioxidants, so they fight the free radicals, which are everywhere. Uh, then we have protein, which balances blood sugar levels gives us the feeling of satiety, and then we have good fats. Good fats will give a uh, balance, like, like a sheet around all of these uh, nutrients, and fat will exactly do the, the thing that we really want to do, is to work on our hormonal balance. So three aspects of the food should be fulfilled in order for these uh, insulin spikes not to happen. So when it comes to food choices, these are like three aspects, but then there are another sections we can improve in order to have the better insulin uh, resistance uh, or the better uh, insulin response in body. So we look at the liver. Liver is a very important organ. In terms of hormonal balance, it's the most important. So we want uh, aspects of uh, cruciferous vegetables, the ones that some for a uh, element. So this is our kale, this is our broccoli, mm -hmm. this is our cabbage, this is our cauliflower. Really important vegetables. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that really basically scoop up all these not good hormones in our liver and get them out of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so the liver has these two detox phases, detox one and detox two phase. So they will help to bring that uh, out of the liver and then with a the good digestion, that will go out of our system. And that's the third part. We look how well actually digestion works. So we have constipation, we have diarrhea. With a lot of these, these patients, you have chronic um, constipation, unfortunately, mm -hmm. due to these hormonal imbalances. We correct that with the proper combination of prebiotics and probiotics. So we get a gut flora stabilized, or we get it corrected if it's inflamed, and often it is, with these type of diseases, particularly with insulin resistance and polycystic ovary syndrome, and voila, we get the excess hormones out and the balance is in order. So mm -hmm. all of these aspects have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And how about Hashimoto's disease? 
This is a very yeah. common, I would say that, I would say probably every second female patient that I see in my practice has a Hashimoto or, or because autoimmune diseases, they come in, in triangle and they often follow each other. So very often pre persons who would have gut disbalance, inflammatory disease of the gut, dysbiosis would have Hashimoto and insulin resistance and often polycystic syndrome goes in hand in hand or they would have some skin inflammatory disease. Um, very often it, it, it has connection with uh, mood swings so you know people with anxiety and depression would have gut disbalance so they really uh, it's really a um, best way to describe it that hormones are little messengers to our body mm -hmm. so when body is under the stress so uh, and we often are so uh, and it's normal response to a stressful situation let's say you have a sick child sick parent um, stress at work um, inevitable stressors war uh, floods uh, earthquakes, those are the, the things that we can't control. But we can always control our response to stress. And this is really important in terms of Hashimoto, insulin resistance, polycystic ovary syndromes, because the hormonal response or how the hormones talk to each other. So when we have the stress response, our body goes like, wow, I have to react. So when we are in the reactive phase, our body doesn't really can differ between physical stress, meaning that how we made up that first homo sapiens, his stress would be you know running away from the physical danger could be running from the lion and tiger you know to the first tree to save its life or if it's physical strong human to actually fight this lion neither of these things are actually most of the time are needed hopefully in our modern life but we do respond in the same way in terms of our hormones so we have to be uh, well aware that these cortisol when starts going up not to do this fight or flight response instead of being reactive we need to learn how to be proactive so if we stay in the stress phase, three things happen. First of all, body says, well, if I'm under stress, I'm saving the life of, you know, Teresa or Amala, you know, I'm not going to like, reproduce, so I'm not making babies. I'm not going to digest the food because that's not essential. And certainly I don't need functional uh, thyroid gland. So these things are basically put into secondary function. The primary function is for us to breed and have proper uh, 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 um, uh, heart rate. So heart rate goes up. We're breathing very uh, superficially. We got this like superficial <sighs> moment where we're like we're running away from the danger, and body is like into, into this response phase. We want to avoid that response phase. We want to be instead of reactive to be proactive. So a very simple thing for everybody to do is to use this cortisol. Cortisol is action hormone, so we need to use it in form of okay, let's go for a walk. Let's do something physical with our body. Let's get off the chair and you know make ourselves a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. You know make a phone call, call the, a friend, uh, somebody dear to us, so we can actually create response to this cortisol. If we stay in the cortisol phase, as I said, we're turning off very three major uh, hormones in our body: hormonal response, digestion, fertility, and uh, thyroid gland. Thyroid gland, as well, is important for the weight issue because thyroid gland regulates our metabolism. So if those hormones are not in order, our metabolism is not in order. So we're not actually metabolizing food. The food is not used in proper way. It's actually shutting down the metabolic rate. So we become, we become less effective. So it's like an engine of the car. It starts working less efficiently all of the time when the stress is constant. And the majority of people, as you well know, people you see in the clinic are chronically stressed. And it's actually a, a, a burnout phase. So we need to work with the uh, um, thyroid issues, with Hashimoto, uh, in kind of a very complex way. That there is, first of all, uh, you know, addressing stress, with the sources of stress, is addressing the gut issue because cortisol is uh, an inflammatory uh, hormone that means it creates inflammation in the gut. So we need to work with digestion because loads of people who have autoimmune disease, have chronic constipation, gut disbalances. Um, it off, very often they would have a gastritis, so they would have heartburns. They can't digest food in any part of your digestive system. So complex as it is, it really can be solved through a nutritional intervention. And I've seen amazing results in terms of you know addressing this disbalance and then you know going onwards with fertility. Because mm -hmm. again, a lot of female patients uh, who have infertility issues would have autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, you have mentioned. Uh Walk, go walking or uh, take a coffee yes. uh, and someone asked us uh, so how is it with the coffee can I actually drink coffee uh, when I'm trying to conceive 
Yes, uh, you can drink coffee, however... Uh, I, I know you like coffee. Yes, so. yes I'm a big coffee. <laughs> and same as you, yes. but particularly about the quality of my coffee, <laughs> which is important as well, and I'll say that, explain why. But uh, two to three coffees have proven scientifically not to have any mm -hmm. uh, influence uh, over, uh, you know, ability to conceive or quality of sperm or egg, but over that number there is a problem because too much coffee can raise cortisol, stress hormones. So if you do drink coffee, enjoy it. And again, uh, too late can affect your sleep patterns. So recommendations are to have a coffee not later than two o'clock in the afternoon. Everything after that can and normally does have effect on your melatonin, your sleep hormone. So ideally, do not drink that after two o'clock. But then prior to that, mm -hmm. enjoy your coffee. Coffee is actually quite beneficial. It's proven to um, be a great antioxidant. As a grain, it's something that um, it's proven to again uh, heavily space and uh, often is so you know look for organic organic one mm -hmm. if possible and good quality one and do enjoy it but you know with uh, you know right amount and not overdoing it and uh, does the same apply for pregnancy it does actually even for breastfeeding mothers after three co a cup of coffee the world health health organization is uh, you know over and over stated that and the thing is with coffee as well, remember it's diuretic. So, you know, with every cup of coffee, drink a glass of water mm -hmm. that doesn't go into recommendation of three liters per day. So, you know, do drink a lot of, co of water with your coffee. Mm -hmm. Does the same apply for alcohol? Yes, so you, went, you, you yes. talked about stress management. Many people uh, manage their stress with a glass of wine. Yes. So, how yes. about that? Uh, well, alcohol is proven to be a neurotoxin, first of all, so works of over, consu over consumption of alcohol can do uh, brain damage in the first place, and that's why it's not recommended during the pregnancy, because, you know, with the neural development of the baby. Um, again, moderation is the key. I will, uh, somebody who enjoys occasional glass of uh, red wine, uh, I mean, uh, it would be very wrong of me to, you know, condemn people who drink alcohol. The problem is that the majority of people do drink too much and too often. So uh, again, alcohol is diuretic, so be aware that anytime you drink, drink alcohol, you have to you know, drink way more water with alcohol, that's number one. Number two, it's inflammatory, so it can create gut issues. So for people who have, have already hormonal disbalances, uh, like we mentioned, Hashimoto, polycystic syndrome, insulin resistance, I would advise them against it. So you know, really it's individual. Mm -hmm. So you know, know your body, talk to your nutritionist, Talk to your health advisor and uh, be very careful of the amount uh, uh, of alcohol and frequency of it. Perfect, thank you. Another question from our viewers. Um, do you have any advice of a nutritional plan for someone who uh, doesn't have regular, regular menstrual cycles? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, um, okay, so that could be due to amenorrhea or so this underweight female that I see that uh, you know uh, doing the excessive sport or a low calorie intake due to weight loss and unfortunately industry as well no uh, fashion industry and the, the whole social uh, network that we're watching you know we see this portrait of female body in a certain way and we all have to embrace that our bodies are beautiful and different so we should not compare and that's something I think that we all have responsibility towards is to uh, work towards the healthy image of a uh, female body more so than a male and there we can do so much more um, so being underweight can definitely uh, have an effect on the regularity of menstrual cycle and often I would see when you know when we increase the weight in a healthy way that you know menstruation comes back and ovulation appears so in order to menstruate and to ovulate you need to have a healthy body weight that equally uh, goes for the overweight uh, patients. So if you're overweight, that's inflammatory for the body because you know lactin hormone that we store in fat tissues has an effect on your hormones and basically can turn off the cycle uh, and it can cause irregularities, spottings, uh, basically high estrogen. I often see with females that they have high estrogen effect because of the you know uh, fat present, uh, uh, vis visceral fat present to their body. So. Weight uh, regulation is huge when it comes to uh, menstrual regularity, mm -hmm. menstrual cycle, and it's all of these hormonal issues, constipation. You know, if they don't have regular bowel movement, can cause uh, hormonal disbalances because the ending part of our colon is um, is one of those parts of the gut that's very well uh, um, equipped with absorption elements. Mm -hmm. So, and I will use very plastic examples for people to understand. So if you don't have the bowel movement in 24 hours, 
So the fecal feces that stays in your colon uh, will sit there. So every toxin, particularly hormone that's in there, because we recycle hormones to our fecal, fecal, uh, uh, fecal, uh, fecal material, material gets absorbed back into the liver. Mm -hmm. So the liver gets these excess hormones back to the colon, to the blood uh, that's uh, blood endings in colon, and the liver goes like, well, I don't want this. Like I'm the cleanest organ in the body, so I want rid of this. So the way the liver does that, it sends that back to the ovaries, so we get cysts, we get tumors, etc. Sends back that to do to your uterus, um, to your uh, to your breast, to your lungs, to your um, brain. So we call that soft tissue organs. Mm -hmm. So be aware that having a regular uh, bowel movement, at least one in twenty four hours, is hugely responsible for your hormonal balance and for your cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any way how can I easily improve my bowel movement? Fiber. Fiber is the key. And again, uh, with the patients, female and male, who are underweight or overweight, there's a lack of fiber, and that's vegetables. Mm -hmm. We do not eat enough of vegetables, and uh, if we uh, eat grains, they're not whole grains, which would be, you know, effective in terms of uh, a proper a proper fiber consumption. So increase the elements of that. Mm -hmm. More so vegetables and fruit. Again, fruit problem with the, the glucose disbalance and sugar, natural sugar mm -hmm. that occurs in, 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 in the fruit. But that's a theme I think we can talk about it in, in, in half hours when it comes to fruit and fruit intake. But certainly more vegetables and more whole grain will make a huge difference mm -hmm. in terms of uh, regular bowel movement and you know talking to nutritionists and your healthcare provider they might prescribe um, probiotic and prebiotics to regulate that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, we have uh, 15 more minutes so uh, I will go to uh, last questions. How can I improve my progesterone levels with nutrition? Yes, progesterone level definitely we can improve. That we call that pregnancy hormone. So progesterone uh, uh, will increase if we decrease amount of testosterone in our body and if it's too much estrogen. Because progesterone is always most of the time actually present in enough quantities if these two hormones are not dominant. So. Again, we talked about uh, polycystic ovary syndrome and autophony syndrome where we see the lack of progesterone present. Uh, we see that, of course, with insulin resistance because insulin, high sugar diet will drive testosterone up and then will turn off our progesterone. So look at the high sugar foods. We mentioned earlier fruit. So that's, for example, a lot of female patients I see make a mistake. They eat a lot of fruit on a daily basis. One to two pieces of fruit per day is more than enough. So one piece really for those who want to regulate their cycle and progesterone and always combine with some nuts and seeds. Why is that important? Because of the fatty acids present in those and they will actually make the sugar go slowly and release slowly in your bloodstream. So we won't have these uh, jumps of your insulin uh, during the cycle of eating, let's say, fruit. Mm -hmm. So if it's one piece of fruit, always eat with some handful of nuts or, or seeds or if you're making a smoothie or, or something similar, always combine it with, with some good fat or let's say you can add some avocado mm. or if, if you don't mind eating savory things then could be a few olives uh, but always always combine fruit with some good fats um, with progesterone as well digestion is the key so you know we have to regulate digestion we already spoke about you know adding fiber into your diet uh, progesterone is well, uh, well affected by you know good fats so you know adding omega-3 fatty acids into your diet will help us with progesterone Sleep is crucial. Mm -hmm. Without sleep, I can't work with progesterone. So I always insist on good quality of sleep. So if you don't sleep, there's no good progesterone. Even though you know you can use progesterone cream, supplementation, please, please sleep. It's so important for my progesterone levels when it comes to my female patients. Um, so 10.30 p.m. Yes. In the bed. <laughs> <laughs> turning off, turning off at 10.30. Please, no matter where you live, uh, 10.30 is like, a, you know, the, the, the ending. Uh, but I would like to eat at 10 o'clock. It would be lovely to see uh, yeah. all my, uh, well, everybody, not even our you know, fertility patients going to bed at 10 o'clock. We often do, uh, underestimate when we're tired, and we spoke about it earlier, like we feel tired probably around 8, 8.30, but what we do is like, okay, I just need an hour for myself or two, and then we end up watching Netflix or, you know, reading too long, but often it's a screen time. And the thing is to remember, maybe something that, again, uh, most people that are watching this uh, and listening to tonight don't realize, that every time we're in front of the screen, our body doesn't make a difference between screen time and actually daylight. lifetime, daylight time. So anytime we get screen time, our body thinks it's a day. So it's pumping all these cortisol to give us awareness. It's stressful time, but it's time when we should actually, you know, 
the, the downtime, so we slowly start, you know, turning off the lights, going into the darker rooms, you know, maybe, you know, uh, reading something, but certainly going for the light version of our activity. Instead, we put ourselves in front of the screen, uh, we want activities, we work on some work assignment or, you know, something, we, you know, work, uh, often students, I see that, and students, um, or, the, you know, um, my female patients are always like, this is the time for me, if they already have family, they kind of like, some time for myself, I have to sleep so I can work, mm. do not work in the evenings, all these workload stuff, whatever it is, or prepare a meal for the next day, do that in the morning, wake up early, wake up at 5, 5, 30, 6, and again, that takes time, this isn't something that you'll do overnight, small steps, big change, that's really important to realize, so if tonight, all of us uh, here, if we can do small change by just going to bed maybe 15 minutes early, that's a huge uh, little step to do. And then tomorrow, another 15 minutes. So in time to come, but maybe in a month's time, we can actually move from going to bed at 12 or 12.30 or 10.30. And we have achieved huge. And, and one of my professors always used to say, tell me how, you, tell me, you, tell me how your sucker looks like, I'll tell you how healthy you are. So you can always pinpoint when and if the most female and male and luckily for us we have a cycle so we can actually like it's one of our vital signs we can actually see where we made the mistake and mm -hmm. i can always say to my female patients uh-huh you were stressed you were overworked you didn't sleep well you did that you did this because your cycle already told me if you have a best tenderness that's estrogen dominance that means lack of progesterone if you didn't sleep correctly if you over exercise under exercise that's all this shows in your cycle PMS, we're normalizing all of these things, unfortunately, when it comes to female health, but nothing of that is normal. That's always a red flag in our body saying, I'm not happy with my owner, do mm. something about it. Mm. So don't normalize, don't say, well, it's everybody does that, everybody has PMS, everybody has mood swings. No, that's not normalized, and it shouldn't be normalized, we should do something about it. Changing our lifestyle is crucial in getting healthier, healthier hormones, and therefore having a better and healthier pregnancies. Great. Um, we are getting uh, to the end of our webinar. Uh, we have one interesting question here. Uh, I have blocked fallopian tubes. Uh, could, I, could I make any changes uh, through my diet to improve my situation? Uh, with blocked fallopian tubes, first and foremost, we have to see a specialist. You know, so we go to a gynecologist um, with uh, IVF clinic here in Prague. We have fantastic doctors who can look into that, and their procedure is actually that can you know work for that. So first of all, you know, see a doctor, see a specialist, and then in terms of diet, we can work with hormonal balance. But certainly, this is a this is definitely a patient to see a specialist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, we have been trying to get pregnant for two years. What should we do? Well, as we said, all of these steps. Uh, firstly, you know, um. In the fertility clinic here uh, has all the proper assessment uh, to do so i think you know come here talk to us uh, tests will be done uh, for both partners and we can see uh, where and what uh, has been done wrong and uh, certainly then the right uh, procedure will take place so all of us can do work together in order to get these couple pregnant but mm -hmm. it can be done so mm -hmm. two years they shouldn't like wait for two years, but if they have done it, us, and we don't know the age of, of course, but um, there's so many things we can do. And mm. certainly we can uh, work in terms of getting them pregnant and obtaining healthy pregnancy and having healthy babies. Perfect. Mm. Uh, similar question. Uh, I'm 49 years old. Uh, is it too late to try naturally? Uh -huh. uh, well, I mean, probably question that. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe I can answer can that. Answer, yes. uh, at this age, if you have uh, been trying over three months naturally and it uh, didn't happen, maybe it's time to um, just visit the specialist, uh, get checked and the specialist can uh, give you an answer whether um, it's, it's okay to try naturally or if you need um, uh, to proceed with some fertility treatment. So we have uh, five minutes left, so it's probably time to wrap up. And this uh, topic is so big that we could be talking for yes. hours. Uh, yes. So we have already <laughs> spoken. The <laughs> yes, so we have been already uh, talking with Anula that we should uh, definitely make a sequel and uh, look into a specific topic because uh, today we touched so many topics and just about overweight uh, or sleeping patterns. We could be talking for an hours, and we have been talking for an hours. Sure. 
Uh, so uh, stay tuned for our next series. Uh, we This uh, webinar has been recorded, so we will be sending you um, the recording uh, afterwards uh, via email that you have provided to us so that you can uh, review it or share it with your partner or friends. Um, then I would like to uh, thank Amla again, uh, not only for her presence, but also she um, she is uh, offering everyone who has been watching this uh, webinar um, ten percent discount for consultation, uh, like fertility consultation uh, with Amela. So if you uh, think uh, there is a specific uh, things you would like to discuss with Amela, or that you would like to lose weight. Uh, hopefully, uh, and because you're trying to conceive, or because maybe you're not trying to conceive, you just want to be the healthier form of you, uh, please uh, reach out to Amela and we will share contact details and uh, with PFC uh, um, password, uh, you can get 10% discount. And one, uh, one thing that we would like to offer as Prague Fertility Center Clinic uh, to all of you is, uh, first of all, a uh, free consultation with our specialists, with our IVF specialists. Um, it can be online consultation because we are well equipped for uh, treating uh, foreign customers, uh, actually, uh, or for foreign patients, uh, actually, couples from 35 uh, different uh, countries uh, have been uh, treated with us so we can we can do a lot of things online uh, prior to the treatment and uh, if you're going to uh, meet Amela for a consultation uh, until later on um, maybe until the end of the year you decide to try fertility treatment with Prague Fertility Center uh, we will um, we will uh, reduce the price of the treatment by, uh, by the amount uh, that you pay this amount so we will get it for free uh, so this is just like a special uh, from all, all, all of us yeah. uh, so again Emma thank you very much it was a pleasure a very interesting talk uh, for all of us and uh, you all thank you very much for attending have a good night Go to the bed early today or 15 <laughs> minutes earlier. Drink your water. <laughs> and uh, don't forget, uh, it takes two uh, yes. to make the change. So uh, share all the news with your partner if you were watching together. And uh, we really believe that uh, you can make a difference and you can conceive ideal naturally. And uh, if it doesn't work, please don't, uh, don't hesitate to contact specialists, either, either us or anyone uh, in your home country. Um, just to see whether everything's fine and just to be calm. I think I'll just add one more thing if you don't mind. I mean, it's a journey and you're not alone. And often couples as well you know, feel very isolated in the process. So uh, sometimes they can't talk to their close relatives or family members. But we really see a lot of patients and thousands and thousands of them on, on a daily basis. And, you know, this clinic has been you know established and it's one of the best in the world so be be willing to reach out uh, because people here really have an experience they have time they have resources and you know even like a, you know a, an open conversation can really help you to see that there are ways of addressing any issues when it comes to fertility and you know with the expertise present here we really uh, it, we make it happen so thank you very much thank you have a good night. Yeah. Yeah.